Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I know if you're like me, you're a little bit sleepy at a post five o'clock session um, on the on the day after so many uh, evening community parties, but we will do our best to keep energy levels high and um, get through this conversation and talk a little bit about um, the Drupal.org engineering team, the work that we do, um, some of the recent progress we've made on a few projects, and also some things that we're working on moving forward uh, to help build more tools to enable the community um, to continue doing what you all do to help build Drupal. So. Um, I do want to start off with a few introductions. Um, we'll introduce the people who are here um, and then talk about some of the other folks who contribute to this team who are not present right now. Um, so for myself, I'm Tim Lennon, Hestinet on Drupal.org. I'm the CTO for the Drupal Association, um, and so I manage this small engineering team and the projects that we do, as well as interface with um, other companies and projects. Um, and uh, other open source um, uh, communities um, to see how we can collaborate uh, as an engineering team with those folks. Um, Ryan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Ryan Aslett. Uh, I go by Mixologic on Drupal.org. I'm the uh, back-end services developer that works on things like um, Drupal CI and packages.drupal.org, and I've been the uh, coordinator for the Composer Initiative most recently, um, and lots of other things like just database queries and stats and figuring things out for the community. So, Cool. And uh, Neil? Uh, I'm Neil Drum. I, uh, see, I do more of the kind of site building development side of things, managing our uh, Drupal sites, uh, and yeah, some automation and, infra and infrastructure stuff. Cool. And then um, some of the team team members who are not here, the last staff member um, who's currently not present is B-Man up here. Uh, are yeah, we not getting our... I don't think you started the slides yet. That's interesting. There we go. There we go. <laughs> B-Man up here, Brendan Blaine, um, who is back in the States right now, um, who supports... If you ever submit tickets to help at Drupal.org, you probably got a response from Brendan. Um, he also does some uh, feature work for things like the event site, um, stuff coming up for DrupalCon Minneapolis, um, just a variety of other things for the team. It really kind of amplifies and provides some user-facing features. Well, um, Neil and Ryan are focused on a lot of the kind of um, core tooling and things that are enabling uh, development of Drupal itself. Um, so that top row is all of the staff in terms of the engineering team on the association. However. We have some key uh, vendor and volunteers. So Narayan Newton with Tag1 Consulting uh, is our sort of infrastructure partner to help us manage uh, both the bare metal hardware and the uh, virtual servers that we uh, use to host the infrastructure. Um, and then uh, Michael Hess is kind of the key super volunteer who helps us out. Uh, you may know him as uh, leading the security working group um, and being part of the infrastructure working group and supporting just a lot of initiatives and projects that we do. I um, want to send out some good wishes to Brendan because he is in Los Angeles where there are some very, very serious fires going on right now, um, and he may be under an evacuation notice soon, so we're uh, wishing him the best at the moment. Um, so talking about what we've been working on recently, um, probably our most important priority has been everything related to getting ready for Drupal 9 um, and everything related to updating Drupal.org's infrastructure to support Drupal 9. So just Generally speaking, I think you're aware of the, the way the release cycle uh, for Drupal works. There's a six-month release of new minor versions, but then the upcoming release of 9 as the next major version. And this means that there are many different elements of uh, Drupal.org that need to be updated to support the presence of a new major version um, and to support that kind of brand new idea of having um, features and modules and things like that that work with both um, Drupal 8 and with Drupal 9 um, and needing to be able to indicate that kind of compatibility. So um, Ryan and Neil, if you could perhaps, oh, the monitor's <laughs> misbehaving, if you could perhaps talk to some, a few of the challenges that have come in supporting the release of Drupal 9. Uh, so yeah, Drupal.org provides uh, services to Drupal sites, uh, update status, uh, localization are two of the big ones. Uh, so. Yeah, when your site checks for updates, um, there it checks a URL on Drupal.org that has a 
eight x in it uh, or uh, nine x in it, except that uh, API compatibility, like this is a Drupal eight module or Drupal nine module, is going to go away because you can have a module compatible with both. So finding places like that and uh, figuring out what we can do with uh, to deal with them and get core updated to uh, not be requesting uh, 9x stuff because the that's less and less of a thing. Um, and there's just other parts where we find there's an 8 hard-coded hard -coded somewhere, so tracking those down and not doing that anymore. Yeah, and there's other areas of, of things that we have to support that might not immediately pop into your, to your mind when you start thinking about it. But for example, the project browser um, on Drupal.org is going to need to have some way of understanding, well, how do I find things compatible with my nine site, all that kind of stuff. There's just a number of problems that we're having to solve recently. Um, and things in the back-end infrastructure to support the, kind of the developers who are working on nine and the people who are trying to test the first releases, whether they're going to be testing them with um, you know, straight composer downloads or uh, however they're uh, whatever other way they might want to do that. So, yeah. do you have anything to add, Ryan? Um, just basically that it's, you know, we've gone from having one possible version and everything fits in a silo, it's either eight or it's seven, to where there's multiple now that work. And so it's, yeah, like dependencies, the composer facade, the releases, the, you know, there's just things all over that we're, you know, discovering and finding that are like, oh, well, this needs to handle both and this needs to handle both. And so, I think also a really big part of getting ready for Drupal 9 has been just supporting the testing infrastructure that's made it possible for the core team and all the contributors to ensure that Drupal 9 is going to be ready for release, uh, the same way that we've ensured that all the uh, you know previous releases of Drupal are available. And um, maybe you can talk about the scale of just what Drupal CI does and the testing environments and that kind of whole Cartesian product of things that we test on a regular basis. Um, yeah, there's probably like 50 something different environments we have at this point. So um, we've got you know PHP containers that are testing the head of PHP. I mean, just the other day, Alex Pot was asking me if he could get a PHP 8 container so that we can start to surface, you know, like like he's been doing a lot of work on getting 7.4 uh, to work, even though 7.4 is not out yet. And because of that, he's revealed upstream bugs in like five different packages that they didn't know they had, even though they thought they were 7.4 compatible. So, you know, we've got a lot of those sort of development PHP ones, and then we've got all the different databases that exist, and then we've got all the stable PHP versions, and so between all that, we have tons of environments that we support, and then, you know, all told, I think since since Drupal inception of Drupal CI, we're up to like a million and a half tests, like testing jobs that we've run that all take about an hour, so, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's pretty big. Yeah, it's a lot. And so like any individual patch that gets submitted in the core issue queue, for example, will take around an hour or longer to run on, you know, a dynamically spun up machine on AWS running the Drupal CI test suite. And these are big um, machine instances. And so it's like 40 cents a run. Um, and you can imagine with the pace of development, something like 10,000 open issues in the core issue queue, um, how that adds up pretty quickly. Um, but sort of expanding on that, and recently, and hopefully coming up soon, um, you've been working with Gabor in particular on um, deprecation testing, yes. and using that to support uh, the idea of understanding what modules in Drupal 8 will be ready for Drupal 9, and who still needs to migrate, and those sort of stats that you saw in the Dries note about, you know, how many modules need one-line changes versus how many are already ready versus how many need more come from this sort of effort to support deprecation testing. So do you want to talk about that a little bit as well? Right, as uh, Gabor had uh, put in the keynote, he had shown a uh, upgrade status module that you can install and uh, shows you what's deprecated with a module. But we're also going to be running this on Drupal.org to run against all of the currently supported modules and put that data on the modules pages so that we can kind of uh, make it visible to people who are looking to you know get a new module for their Drupal 9 site, oh, is this one ready or not? And that, that way, um, you know, soon, soon there will be deprecation data available on all, on all the individual project pages. So, sort of a, uh, you know, using that static analysis tool that uh, Matt Clayman wrote. So. Right. So, um, I'll add here, um, as we go into other topics, that if you have questions as we're going along, feel free to come up to the mic, and if it's a convenient time to pause, we'll do that and let you ask questions as we go. We'll also take questions at the end, but if anything really occurs to you that you'd really like to know more about, feel free to just come on up as we're speaking and we'll make sure to slip that in. So, the nice thing about deprecation testing is if you follow the Twitter handle for 
you know, uh, drop is moving. Um, you probably saw that this, this looks slightly different than the stats that were in the keynote because the stats in the keynote were about all modules, whether they were originally for seven or eight. But if you look just at eight modules, over 40% of them are actually already non-compatible. Um, so that's actually extremely exciting um, and something that um, because of how many, how because of how many only need like one line changes to fix, can rapidly grow, and it's something at the contribution days tomorrow. I think a lot of people here at the con could make significant uh, progress on. So, very excited about that. Um, um, one, yeah, just one more thing I'd like to add about the Drupal eight to nine readiness thing is, you know, we're we're trying to avoid having like nine dot x dash module names. We're trying to trans. Uh, transfer, transition over to using semantic versioning on core or on on contrib modules on Drupal.org. So that's also part of all this prep work is getting getting it so that there is no longer a uh, you know a nine dot x branch. That, yeah, if you're a module maintainer in the future, it really should just be that you have you know version one of your module, version two of your module, whatever, and hopefully that's both eight and nine compatible, or eventually if it uses things that have um, that have only come in and minor releases of nine, it's nine only compatible and things like that. But using proper semver in uh, the contrib space is a kind of important advancement uh, for the project moving forward as well. So, please. Um, I was just curious if you. Oh, this one actually works. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious if uh, how you envision that in the long run transitioning into like <coughs> could a module well theoretically maybe a module could be compatible with like eight, nine, and ten, um, but like it might only be compatible with nine or ten. So like, uh, do you, could is there anything you could speak on? Have you had any thoughts on how the long term viability of Semver? Well, that's a good question. There's been some debates going on about, so we, we have a monthly call with the core team, the core committers, to talk about how we're going to handle, like, again, the project browsing side of this is compatible with XYZ, and you, you, there's, you know, there's the composer style compatibility information that can say compatible with version whatever and above, or with this between this and this and that, and we're probably going to start sort of parsing similar sorts of more complex but more accurate um, compatibility information um, and trying to make that available. It becomes slightly difficult to browse, so what we're sort of thinking about is, you know, how could you go to a, uh, a module page and be able to perhaps say, well, here's my current version, you just tell me yes, no, is that going to be compatible? Yeah, and it's not just compatible with 8 and 9, it's compatible with 8, 5 or later, or uh, more detail than that. So. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a thorny problem that we've run into because of the new six-month uh, release cycle and the dual compatibility of 8 and 9, and it has huge benefits in terms of being able to upgrade sites and deliver features faster, but from kind of a UI point of view of discovering modules on Drupal.org, it's going to give us some problem, some challenges to solve. Cool, so I'd like to talk also a little bit more about automatic updates in just a little bit more detail perhaps than you saw in um, what was in the keynote presentation. Um, I won't replay the video because uh, I can't stand the sound of my own voice. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but we can talk through it a little bit more. Um, so I just do want to give a shout out. The European Commission sponsorship of this initiative has been huge. That kind of partnership, um, you know, we would not be here saying, hey, there's going to be a stable version of the, even the first phase of work uh, by the end of the year without the benefit of significant sponsorship to accelerate that. So it's been really, really important. Um, but there's a variety of things that are, you know, there's building the automatic updates module, but there's also sort of infrastructure around supporting it. Um, so Neil, maybe you can talk about what happens when the up automatic updates module is sort of looking to Drupal.org to know how to update a site? Yeah, so, yeah, automatic updates, that's another service that we're starting to provide, another API. Um, part of, so automatic updates, it has some pre-flight checks. Uh, you, know, you don't want to update your site automatically if you have changes to files if you've hacked. Uh, you know, some something else into one of the core modules. Uh, automatic updates will be could break your site in that case. So uh, we have a API for um, the hashes of all, all the files in every release. So you can uh, use that to check if your uh, site is consistent with what it should be uh, your code base uh, and. 
the we also have a API for um, alerting sites if there's a security release coming up. Um, initially, the scope of automatic updates will be um, your site will update automatically if there is a uh, critical, a highly critical security release. Uh, so we have a um, API that. Uh, when the announcement comes out that uh, there will be one of those next Wednesday, um, your site will be able to say, hey, the site will automatically update around this time. Uh, the pre flight checks are passing or failing. Uh, and let site owners know that that's coming up. Um, and the actual updates themselves uh, were packaging in a different way. So we send only the files that have changed uh, from version to version. Um, so, and can you speak to whether do I have to if I'm updating my site do I have to go from 8.7.4 to 8.7.5 to 6 to 7 to 8 going up or yeah we'll uh, so for our side we'll make an uh, update file for anything that gets requested uh, you could request an update from 8.6.3 to Drupal 510, and we'll, we'll tell you about files changed. <laughs> uh, and it's up to the automatic updates. Uh, you know, the automatic updates module, uh, what's going to core, uh, it's a module right now. Um, that's responsible for um, having a sane UI. Yeah. Uh, and, but yeah, jumping around version numbers is possible. Um, and yeah, the, in general, taking things a little bit slow uh, on the UI side of things, uh, just because this is new and updates do occasionally break sites, so we don't want to update, automatically update thing, everything all the time, but uh, yeah, we're not building a CI system for every Drupal site. Yeah, so the, the contributed module, which is the basis of the first phase of work, has an, uh, I believe the latest release is an alpha 3 release. And so that does support all of the pre-flight readiness checks. It, it supports the included file backup so that if it like fails in flight of doing the, like something fails on the request to get the package or something like that, it should be non-destructive and roll that back. Um, uh, and it um, also includes the ability both to manually initiate that automatic update or to begin setting it to run on cron. So we do have some uh, brave souls who are testing, you know, staging versions of their sites to, to let us know if anything's uh, causing trouble, but it's actually working remarkably well. And if you are interested in digging into the guts of it, it's um, actually a remarkably concise uh, module in terms of the total lines of code and things like that. There's nothing too crazy going on there. Um, but, you know, even just that PSA feature, I think, is kind of a tremendous improvement because, as you know, that red message that says there's a security update available for your uh, site is something that only happens after it's been released, after it's been published. Being able to publish the PSAs that come, you know, maybe two weeks before or however long before at least gives that extra breathing room to people who maybe don't follow what happens on Drupal.org as closely as perhaps they should. Um, so we're hoping that uh, the broader base of sites will be more secure as a result of this, and then eventually, you know, those uh, small to medium-sized site owners um, will have just a, um, a lower maintenance way to keep up to date with their Drupal sites. So, um, uh, and also the uh, uh, updates API we're providing is uh, we're building a signing in infrastructure as well. So. You know. Hey, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll introduce this a little bit more and then you can talk about it some, you know, but this, the, um, there's a lot of other projects, a lot of other CMSs that have begun implementing an automatic updates uh, infrastructure, but there's been um, some controversy, a little bit of drama about how secure the updates are, because obviously if you are enabling a system that can request some package of files and overwrite your doc root with whatever files are there. That's potentially a truck-sized security hole if there was any kind of impersonation of the update server or sort of man-in-the-middle uh, situation, right? So from the get-go, we want to make sure that the updates we providing are, we're providing are highly secure. And there's a few different elements going into that, including a related project that we're going to be using that is um, agnostic to CMS systems that the wider PHP ecosystem can use. But uh, Neil, I'll let you speak to the parts of it you, that you'd like to. Um, 
Yeah, I, we're figuring out uh, getting a isolated, building out a isolated server to do the actual signing to kind of re reduce exposure from the rest of our infrastructure. Uh, and the software that uh, it wrote is based on BSD uh, Signify, um, and we're adapting uh, that a bit. Uh, so it should be good for any uh, any project if they want to use it. And, yeah. Yeah, we're freaking out uh, what the best practices are for like key rotation and handling. Like, do we have to meet somewhere <coughs> every quarter and exchange keys and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, meet in the park wearing a, 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 low, a low hat and passing a newspaper to change the signing keys every quarter. No, but we'll figure it out. We are going to use some uh, hardware based uh, keys as part of the signing, uh, the chain of trust that we're using to sign these. We'll have package expiration so that when a package is signed from Drupal.org, there'll be a period of time for that uh, for which it works, and then it'll be re-signed. Maybe that's a quarter quarterly uh, process, um, but all of that should help ensure that we don't get some sort of major vulnerability uh, as a result of just creating this automated update process. And we think that's kind of critically important. Every Drupal coin. Huh. To exchange keys every Drupal card. Uh, it's a good. It's a good possibility, actually. It might be. Uh, it might be kind of an event. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> uh, I live on the east coast of the U.S. and they live on the west coast of the U.S. So yeah. we're not going to spend too much money on exchanging <laughs> keys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do think we have a, a key exchanging ceremony, though. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll probably get some robes and, yeah. and fancy hats for the whole <laughs> affair. Um, so I, I'd also like to spend some time talking about the Composer Initiative. And this is um, this is an interesting case study for us on the uh, Drupal Association engineering team because historically the DA has actually been kind of deliberately firewalled off from things related to Drupal core. There was a, especially around the early creation of the DA, there was this perception that, okay, the, the purpose, the fundamental goal of the DA is to provide support infrastructure, but stay hands off from the product in order to allow the community to just keep building Drupal as it was. Um, but truthfully, uh, as, even then, but especially now, Drupal.org really is part of the product. Like so many of the services, like the update system, localization, all of those things come from Drupal.org anyway. So it's important for us to be more closely involved and having Ryan be one of the initiative leads for the Composer Initiative that was talked about in the Dries note um, has kind of proved out uh, the value of that collaboration. So um, do you want to speak to um, kind of what went on there? Yeah, sure. Um, if you come to my session seven hours ago, you will have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Or watch um, the video. <laughs> or watch the video. Yeah, that's true. It's online. Um, so there was, uh, you know, Composer and Core has kind of evolved over time to where we started with um, just Core itself was using Composer packages so that it could you know leverage the power of Symphony and leverage the power of third-party development and you know expand out into the broader ecosystem. And then community members were like, "Well, I want to do that with my module too." And so they started um, building things, um, making you know the Composer Manager module was a tool that people were using for a while. And then somebody said, well, I also want to be able to install my modules using Composer. So a community member built a um, package repository. And then as we saw this package repository, we saw it like kind of gaining speed. We're like, we should offer a, another service. And so that's where we added packages.drupal.org that all the Composer um, sites use as their, um, as their you know, package repository. And then it became even more mainstream. And some people were saying, well, like, how do I actually use this? How do I make this work because I, you know, I download a copy of uh, Core using a Git clone and I start doing stuff and then when it comes to time to update, everything is a mess. Like I have to like do this merge conflict and things are broken and like what do I actually do? And then we realize there's no real official way to do it because it's like, okay, well there's this, there's this, you know, secret door you have to knock on and someone will knock back and you go on the inside and then they tell you the, the password to the you know, the special GitHub repository where somebody out in the community has built this thing. And it was, you know, it was never, not easy to find. It wasn't like prone on Drupal.org. Uh, so some people who were in the know knew to use it, but it wasn't necessarily official. So we're like, well, we need to, you know, eliminate the possibility for people to like shoot themselves in the foot. We need there to be an official supported, this is how you do it with Composer and this works and it's tested and it's in core. So that was um, sort of the genesis of the Composer initiative and, um, what we've done is kind of incorporate a lot of the tools that the community had already built. Like we had taken the scaffold 
file that was basically with any composer project, you know, when you have your the Git repo with core, you've got your robots.txt and your HT access and like all of these other files that are um, not really part of the product, but just kind of scaffolding. Um, well, in a composer project, those were getting put into place by the scaffold tool that was calling back to uh, seek it or now GitLab to pull all those individual files every time someone was installing their site. So Drupal.org was getting hit with thousands of file requests. And we were like, why is millions. our... Yeah, <laughs> mil yeah. <laughs> millions, of, millions of requests. And especially like when there was a major upgrade or a security incident, you know, it's like everyone's upgrading at once and everyone with the Composer site is upgrading at the same time. And it was like, whoa, our Git server is suffering. How can we fix this? So we changed the scaffold and improved it so that now they package ships with ships with its own scaffold files. So like Drupal Core comes with its own scaffold files and it tells you where to put them when you get it. So now we've made it so that there doesn't have to be any requests in Drupal.org, they just come in the packages by default. And so we've got that, um, the various meta packages that uh, Webflow had built, you know, a version that is like, here's all your dependencies that are going to lock um, your site so that the upstream dependencies don't break you. Because that was another issue where we're like, we're using Composer, yay, and Twig changed a thing and it broke everybody's site. And we're like, well, we don't want, Twig will still change things and break things, but we don't want everyone's site to break. So we want to have like a nice stable like platform of, of which we don't upgrade above unless we really want to. And that's when you do core upgrades. And so we've you know created the core recommended meta package and the uh, core dev meta package, which is like the development dependencies and core dev pin, which is the development dependencies, but specific versions. So We've got all, all these things in there, and now, now there's an official way to um, install Composer, which means that we can now finally go to the Drupal page and go to the downloads page and say, you know, here, get started with Drupal. Here's how, and you know, and put the Composer instructions in there from the get-go instead of like download this tarball, but you really should use Composer. You know, it's it, it allows us to kind of actually start funneling people down the right path of you know making Composer work really well in core. And so now, you know, the, the next step phase, the next step is to make Composer much more performant because it is slow, it is uh, cryptic, uh, it tells you things that are hard to parse and hard to figure out, and we've got ideas and ways to solve for all of these, and if we can get it really fast, then someday it might be that Composer replaces all of Core's uh, extension management, and then it's just, it's in there, it's quick, it, and it does what it needs to do, but there's still a lot of work to do, though. Um, but yeah. that's... Yeah, that's awesome. kind of basically where that's at. And, you know, speaking of the, the tarball or zip file download and all that kind of thing, the other benefit of doing all of this work and standardizing on a single way within core is that as of 8.8, when, if you do start by downloading a tarball, you're not, you're not screwed because it's not set up in the same way that a composer scaffolded project needs to be set up. You'll be okay if you need to convert to a composer project. Um, so, oops, I've lost my mouse again. There we go. So in addition to like this sort of fundamental work on kind of key features that support um, Drupal as a, as a product, as a, as a software project, we, you know, we're also maintaining Drupal.org as the home of the community. So there's a variety of smaller features that we've gone through. I'll go through very quickly on these because there's some other big topics I know we wanted to talk about as well. But we've done little things like update the case study browser um, and the case study format fix the way that it's filtered so that uh, people evaluating Drupal can better find uh, related case stories to their own use cases and understand that their peers can also have, have been using Drupal successfully and maybe they should too. Um, uh, Neil deployed this work um, to automatically generate the uh, table of contents. Some community members were involved in sort of specking this out and getting it ready to go, but all of the documentation now automatically generates this sidebar, makes it much easier to navigate. Um, and then similar things as well, um, uh, uh, Justifish, uh, Sally, uh, contributed some code to add the language tags that you've probably seen in the issue queues if you've been contributing recently, um, and the location information that allows us to give those sort of cultural context clues so that when people are collaborating internationally, they actually know, okay, um, uh, is this person being stubborn or obstinate, or maybe they don't quite understand the language I'm using, and maybe I should be a little bit more compassionate and empathetic about how I'm interacting with other folks on Drupal.org. So we just want to provide those little clues to help promote kind of community health. 
Um, there are a few things coming up next. Um, uh, well, really, there's about a million things on our roadmap, but there are some that are in the kind of more near term. Um, related to, you, you might remember this slide if you saw the DrupalCon Seattle uh, presentation. This was about kind of the current demographics of our community. There's a completely opt-in uh, demographic section on everybody's user profile. We've got about 30% more respondents in Seattle than we had before, but I'd encourage people to fill that out. And that's giving us information about uh, the diversity of our community and who's been included. Um, uh, we're going to be uh, deploying additional work, like expanded options for gender identification that comes out of the Open Demographics Initiative. Uh, we are working with an organization, Zixware has uh, volunteered to kind of put forward a prototype initiative that we hope might become a core initiative to create a project messaging channel that would take a feed from Drupal.org and create news and announcements directly in the admin interface of Drupal so we could reach, reach a presumably much, much wider audience um, of Drupal users out there, site owners who might have no knowledge of what goes on on Drupal.org. Like it's 97% of the traffic to D.O. is um, uh, not authenticated traffic, not logged in users. Right, so we have to assume that there's this huge percentage of people who probably aren't highly engaged in our communication channels and could get some really valuable information if it was pushed into the uh, Drupal admin interface. So we'd like to work with the core team to see if we can get that work in. Um, there's other, oh, some extensions. Hmm. Um, we'd like to think about Drupal groups and community events and how we can work with, say, the team that maintains Drupal Cal or to create something like maybe a submission feed and then a published JSON feed of events through Drupal.org and things like that. So it's figuring out details about how we would do that, but we want to support global community events um, and all of that work. Um, merge requests. <laughs> um, this is something that I know is like top of mind for a lot of people and something that, you know, a, a few months back, well, maybe at the end of Seattle, we were sort of hoping we could, we might have been able to be here and say, hey, they're ready. But all that work to support Drupal 9 and make sure that Drupal 9's release would be ready to go on time kind of took over the priority. But Neil, maybe you can speak a little bit to where we are with uh, GitLab and merge requests work. Uh, yeah, so have kind of proof of concept level stuff working. Uh, the plan is uh, when we're ready to roll it out project by project. So a few pilot projects will use it. Probably some of the uh, modules we maintain for built in Drupal.org. Uh, and then once that's figured out, uh, we go through the how collaboration works in merge requests, um, then rolled out to the core issue queue and um, every project. Uh, the key difference we have from what you've seen on GitHub or uh, GitLab.com uh, is uh, Drupal issues are collaborative. Multiple people come through and post patches and... Uh, a single stream of comments. Yeah. yeah, into a yeah single stream of comments. And merge requests on uh, GitHub tend to be uh, one person um, driving uh, an issue uh, and sol resolving it. There's not a lot of collaboration. And if you do collaborate, you have to figure out how to fork someone else's fork, and you, know, you can't post it back to the original issue. Uh, so providing forks that everyone can access and push to, and then we have to figure out the access control on top of that. So you know, get it's easy to overwrite your own work. Uh, you also uh, don't want to make a mistake and overwrite someone else's work. Yeah. So there's a lot of work there in terms of just really the most of the work around this at this point is um, is not so much the technical challenge of implementing it. I mean, Niels had a proof of concept on one of our dev sites that can make a fork for an issue and then be able to start opening branches and things on that. But but it's those sort of um, in a corporate world, you'd call them business logic. Like it's the it's the user logic of how we want the collaboration to work with those branches and forks, and what we want the UI to look like as things get posted back to the issue queue that we really need to work on. But hopefully, this is more like a matter of months than than much longer. Um, so it should be quite soon. Yeah, and the other part will be, um, you know, in all of these systems, you have a, the issue, and then uh, you have other conversation uh, on the merge request. So, uh, which is good. You separate the high level, we want to build this thing from the uh, nuts and bolts of 
fix the coding standards here. Um, but providing the visibility of the issue that there's stuff happening in the merge request will also be a UI uh, thing to figure out. Yeah. So we're beginning to run a little bit low on time, so I'll move fairly quickly. Again, do feel free to jump up to the mic if you have a few questions. We're the last session, so hopefully we can spend a little bit extra time if we need to. The other huge thing that we have is Drupal.org's own 8 slash 9 migration process. Uh, Drupal.org relies on a lot of custom modules that basically only we use. Um, and so that means there hasn't been a big community effort to port those modules to new versions. It's all just, you know, kind of on us when we're ready to do it. So 2020 is really going to be the year of figuring out that migration process for us. And we want to do it in a progressive way. Um, we're looking at, there's some examples out there for, um, of other sites who have used their, their CDN layer to route some traffic back to their old site and to do a single section of their new site at a time and just change the CDN direction so that you have your seven sites still in place and the new eight sections going out piece by piece. Uh, we want to look at that and see if that's something that'll work for us. So um, there'll likely be a lot more information about this. Um, if you did want to help with anything related to that, you'd want to check out the readiness of some of the modules that maybe aren't just Drupal.org specific, but that we do use, um, or help us reduce scope. Um, we're trying to find, you know, there's a lot of technical debt in, in 15 years of Drupal.org or however much it is. So there, there's whole features and areas of content that probably don't need to be there anymore. And rather than migrate them, we should remove them and save ourselves the work. Um, and just have some patience because it'll be a really large undertaking. Um, the very last thing I want to talk about, and the thing that I, if we need to, I'll hang around afterwards uh, to talk about a little bit, is the contribution credit conversation. So, uh, you know, the sorting the marketplace by contribution and the uh, addition of credit uh, in issues for individuals as well as for organizations is something we implemented in 2016. Um, and those changes that were proposed in the Dries note are things that we're going to be supporting from a technical level. And there's, it's conceptually pretty simple, but there's sort of two problems to solve. So one is more completely measuring the different types of contribution activity, right? We need to capture every kind of thing that people do, whether it's event organization, sponsorship, activities on DDO or off DDO, um, and capture all of those completely. But having measured that activity, we do need to, to decide how to weight it, what multipliers apply, and realize that as we do so, we are deliberately creating incentives for certain things. Right. If we choose to, for example, say that um, having case studies is really important to the project right now, and so we weight highly having case studies, we can expect that that's going to introduce a behavior of bringing a lot more case studies. If we weigh heavily on project usage, as we currently do right now, that encourages contributions to core and the most highly used modules, but maybe that has a negative impact on up and coming modules that might be the next use or something like that. So we have to think carefully about how we're going to do all of those things. Um, but the goals are dramatically increase the types of things that we recognize, um, in particular finding ways to do the non DDoT activities like I mentioned before, having this robust and tunable system of weights and measures that we can adapt as the priorities of the project change or as we find issues, um, and then having that committee that Mike Lamb spoke about in his original message um, uh, to talk about this. So just like you know, general examples, these are some things we measure now some notions of what some multipliers on those might be, but there's also a lot of things that we don't measure that we're already aware of, right, that we would like to be able to measure. Um, and then once recorded in the system, it's pretty simple. It's the count of how many times that activity's been done, any relevant multipliers, and the weight we set overall to give a kind of priority to it um, to be added up and created this sort of background contribution score. And, you know, the other thing we should say there is it's, it's not our goal to create the sort of one, two, three, four ranking of individuals or organizations so much as support this conversation about recognizing and rewarding the people who make Drupal and encouraging others to do more to become those same good Drupal citizens. So um, I'm sure this is going to be a hot topic. There's uh, the uh, contribution credits uh, committee that you could nominate yourself for. There's an issue where people have been providing a lot of feedback on their ideas on what we should measure, what the weights might look like. Um, so feel free to participate there. Um, just as a reminder to everybody who's in the room, I threw this in there because it's a message that should get out there. Uh, Drupal 7 and Drupal 8s both have extended, uh, have end of, official end of life on, in November of 2021. 
Um, there will be extended support available from a couple of vendors for those folks who need it. But it's just something that's good to keep in mind. Um, and maybe if you're a Drupal 7 site maintainer in the room, oh, like us, <laughs> you, should, you should probably get on your migration pretty quick. Um, and so uh, please join the contribution activities tomorrow. Um, you can contribute to making sure that modules are ready for Drupal 9. Those one-line changes to switch from like Drupal set message to the new ways of doing messages are an easy way to contribute. There's all sorts of things you could do. Um, we'll be around. You can certainly talk to us as well. Um, and you can, of course, uh, leave your feedback about the event as a whole or individual sessions. So if there are any final questions, I know we're technically pretty much out of time, but please come up to the mic so the recording has it. Uh, thanks for all you do, number one. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is a weird one, so I don't, I, I've got my own ideas, but how do you deal with old content on DO when you're searching for something, an answer to something, and you're like, oh, I found it, no, Drupal 5. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, just to share the idea, it's like, is there any ideas or work going towards like uh, a tagging system or a voting system? on documentation or content on the website, where if I found something like that, I could just hit the button and say, I think this is old. Yeah. And maybe then, um, you know, if enough people do that, or I'm God, um, <laughs> you know, that uh, gets devalued in Google or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. Neil knows more about the solar indexing than I do, but. Yeah, we don't have a lot of control over what Google uh, indexes. Sure. Uh, but we have, uh, or really any control. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, at a point, you could like uh, block no, no index, index block. Index. Index. So, yeah. yeah uh, with our last documentation refresh, uh, we uh, started a migration. Uh, we're still doing a migration to the new documentation system, and part of that was let's actually delete pages. Uh, so deleting things that are completely useless, that are completely old. Uh, so that's something that historically wasn't done as much. Yeah, I think. Uh, and yeah, our solar index, it's, it does uh, have the date something was created as a factor, a uh, pretty minor factor, but yeah, we could uh, uh, do more of that. And as research for the documentation migration, there was a one off kind of survey uh, to uh, on each documentation page. Um, we could think about having the yeah, is this helpful stuff uh, there? Yeah, but and maybe probably even, after Drupal nine. Yeah, Drupal eight migration. Yeah, I think I think that would be interesting. I think, you know, we we don't intend. I hope. To, I hope we, our current intent is to finish the migration of the old stuff to the new content types before we would migrate anything, and at that point, hopefully, we're getting rid of a lot of that cruft. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's reasonable, and I think some notion of like setting a no index thing if it, if it's been marked like out of date or obsolete is, is not a bad idea. It's not supported anymore. Or unsupported, yeah. Yeah, we do have the uh, the newer documentation system has a uh, flag on it for incomplete or outdated stuff. So we do we actually could index that. Yeah. Uh, please. Thank you for all your work. And I just had a quick question about the federated login and how it was. Oh right. Um, yes. To enable any number of things, yeah. So federated login, um, SSO, OAuth, uh, all these sorts of topics is something that's come up a lot um, and could enable actually quite a lot of things for the community. So if you could use your Drupal.org login on campsites, on uh, chat programs, on all sorts of things, you could kind of carry your Drupal identity throughout a variety of different places. So it is absolutely still on the plan to uh, have some kind of offering for that. We are actually sort of it's related, I think, at this point. You know, thinking has been evolving a little bit on this, but it's probably going to be part of how we handle some of the um, migration process is start pushing some of the core profile information into an identity provider um, as we are thinking about our 8 and 9 migrations. So we're still planning to do it. Um, it's likely that we'll use, uh, particularly if we can get donated services, we'll use a cloud vendor for identity management of some sort. We haven't picked the exact one. We're talking to a couple of them right now. So. Um, I think that's the most I can say because I don't have an exact timeline. Did um, 
did we ever get our policy straight on that too? Like as uh, far as like yeah, we did publish a draft policy on how um, federated identity could be used. Uh, I probably did that at Drupal Europe. I think uh, published that first draft. I don't know that there's been a huge amount of feedback, but I think it's enough to move forward with uh, when we get the technology lined up. So, any last questions? Well, if not, thank you very much. And by the way, all your support and help as individual members or supporting partners, all those things is what, among other things, pays our salaries, but also pays for those Drupal CI tests, pays for the hosting of Drupal.org. You know, there's 20 terabytes of traffic to the updates system every month. Um, it's a lot of work that we, uh, and a lot of resources that it takes. So thank you for all of that support.